Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I think we're just at 11.15, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Melissa Logan. I'm a member of the Data on Kubernetes community, as we all are here. Um, Data on Kubernetes community has been around since 2020, and we help end users learn best practices for running all kinds of data workloads on Kubernetes. Um, we host monthly virtual meetups. Uh, next month, I believe, we're doing one on uh, Valky and Kubernetes. Um, we host a lot of different talks from uh, end user case studies, technical talks, how to's, et cetera. We hope you can join us. There's about 3,000 people in our meetup. Um, we also just launched a DOK report. We've been tracking trends for the past three or four years in data on Kubernetes. Just yesterday at DOK Day, we launched our 2024 report. Uh, there's some really interesting information in there about AI. You may have heard of it. Um, there was also relevant to this panel some really uh, re uh, inf good information about databases. It's been the number one workload that people are running on Kubernetes for three years running. So really interesting to see that people are trusting Kubernetes, most, their most mission critical data to uh, Kubernetes um, with their databases. Uh, really cool to see. So we're excited to talk to you today about the future of DBaaS on Kubernetes. Uh, we have a great group of panelists, all different perspectives. We'll start by letting them introduce themselves. Sergey? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Because I am okay. Awesome. Yeah, my name is Sergey. I'm a product guy at Percona. What I joined Percona, I think, four years ago. And as you see, I have had, had, had hair before that. And uh, that's what databases on Kubernetes are <laughs> doing with that's me. That's the toll you so, <laughs> Yeah, four years ago, I joined Percona, really. And my main focal point since then was working on our Kubernetes operators, cloud native story, and so on. So I'm pretty excited to be here today. Hi, my name is Deepti Sigredi. I'm the project lead and a maintainer for Vitas, which is a CNCF graduated project. Vitas is a um, open source horizontal scaling system for MySQL. And we actually also provide and support a Kubernetes operator for running Vitas. Uh, I'm also a software engineer at PlanetScale, where we run a commercial uh, managed database service, which is running on uh, Kubernetes and Vitas. And I'm Gabriele Bartolini. Don't let my hair fool you. You know, I've been you know, uh, working with databases in Kubernetes for many years, and it's been fa painful, especially at the start, but not now. And uh, I'm a Postgres contributor. I've been using Postgres for 25 years, and uh, I'm now vice president and chief architect for Kubernetes at EDB. EDB is one of the main contributors to the open source Postgres project. And uh, I'm a founder and maintainer of an operator called CloudNetApp PG which we recently submitted again to the CNCF Sandbox. And uh, so today I will bring my point of view in terms of Postgres usage in Kubernetes from a DBAS point of view. Thank you. Excellent. So um, depending on hair, I guess, might be a way you can judge people <laughs> doing database. I don't know. We'll see. Um, it was pretty daring to do databases on Kubernetes several years ago. A lot has changed. So can you all just kick us off by talking about what has changed to drive this interest and adoption of databases on Kubernetes and DBaaS on Kubernetes? Well, I'll start with Gabriela. Yeah, OK. So I think uh, uh, you know, databases, they, they rely on storage. Storage is the most critical component in a database. And if the storage doesn't work, the database doesn't work. So the evolution of storage in Kubernetes has been impressive. And uh, um, right now, there's a, there's a lot of uh, improvement also in the volume snapshot area. Uh, we have con contributors uh, from you know, Cloud Native PG that also improve the volume group snapshot feature for backup and recovery. As you know, backup and recovery is part of day two operations, which are critical in, uh, when you talk about a database in Kubernetes. So local persistent volumes were introduced in 2019. And I think from there, we've seen uh, a continuous improvement of, you know, for running databases in Kubernetes to the point that now we encourage uh, everyone that moves from VMs or bare metal Postgres or even IS uh, Postgres um, uh, to move to even bare metal with local storage, because Postgres has a very advanced 
uh, uh, replication system, native replication system that can control synchronous replication at the transaction level. So you can you know, synchronize this state that way and achieve HA, disaster recovery, and so on. So I think this is, uh, in my opinion, the, the biggest uh, reason for, for people moving um, inside Kubernetes. The other one is Kubernetes itself. You know, managing infrastructure is complex, is a complex problem, and uh, the simplification that Kubernetes introduced in managing infrastructures through modularization is amazing. So we don't have to know everything about Kubernetes when you manage databases, but you need to know everything around the interface. And I think this is a, also a driver for adopting databases more and more uh, in Kubernetes. And then we will talk about Dbus more specifically because that's a sub-branch of these, but uh, you know. Deep, deep. I think the other thing that uh, has really evolved in Kubernetes and enabled some of these uh, use cases is networking. So we are running a multi-tenant uh, managed database, and we have to provide isolation between the various users. You cannot have uh, user A be able to access data or a database that belongs to user B. And this has become really easy in recent years with Cilium, network policies, ingress, egress, et cetera. Uh, but uh, an, I think another thing that has driven people towards Kubernetes is the fact that the number of database workloads just keeps increasing. And it is extremely difficult to find good people to manage your databases that you're running in-house. So either you have to end up uh, outsourcing that to some managed database provider, or you have to figure out a way to scale your deployment without having to hire an ever-increasing number of people, and Kubernetes really enables that. I just want to add to that. We had a good talk yesterday at Kubernetes as your DBA, and Karen is here who gave that talk, and it was, it was you know, kind of touched on this topic, some of what you're talking about. Sergey? Yeah, I think what I can add to what guys just said is um, four years ago, I think it's more about maturity and the story here, because what we see mostly is that Kubernetes matured a lot in different aspects, and more and more companies were adopting Kubernetes to run stateless applications. And now, like, they're at the point where all their workloads are already in case, and it just makes sense to move everything else, including databases, in it. And if you have tried to do that like four years ago, you might have seen how immature was storage, was networking in case, what kind of issues you would face without operators uh, when you try to run databases. And now it kind of all makes sense because all the things, all the synergy around all these technologies is at the great point where you can do it safely, you can do it in a mature way where it can also uh, answer all your enterprise-ish questions around running database in Kades. Yeah, and what you said, Sergey, that has been validated in some of the data we saw in the DOK report too, where people are saying they are standardizing on Kubernetes, they want to standardize on Kubernetes and have both stateful and stateful, stateless workloads there. Um, so uh, who is doing this? Who is running database on Kubernetes now? Can you all share customer stories? Um, any examples you can share, Sergey? Yeah, I have a, there are lots of customers who signed NDA, who were signed NDA for and so on. But there are a couple of customers who I can share. Um, first one is uh, Nokia. Uh, they build the, uh, their own database as a service, private database as a service on, on top of operators. Another one is Broadcom. They're actually running thousands of different databases in Kubernetes. and. Uh, uh, I was quite surprised on the variety of operators that they use. So they have like, I think, 20 different operators to run everything on top of it. Um, Sivo, I don't know anyone knows about this company. They also build their own database as a service <laughs> on top of it. So yeah, that's on top of my mind. And there are many more, but I can't disclose those. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Deep -tea? Uh, with Vitus and MySQL, HubSpot was a very early adopter of Kubernetes, and they actually 
uh, built an in-house database as a service back in 2017. They built their own Kubernetes operator. There was actually no MySQL Kubernetes operator, no Vitus Kubernetes operator at that time. Um, a more recent adopter is um, Shopify, who uh, had initially built a, what they call Kate SQL, uh, MySQL on Kubernetes, which um, their internal team provided as a service to their application teams, which needed databases. And more recently, they have migrated to Vitess, so they are now uh, running Vitess as a database service for their application teams. And this brings up something that uh, I should have mentioned earlier. One of the things that's driving this adoption is also the microservices trend. Uh, each application in an enterprise is running its own microservices, and they don't want to all be running against the same monolithic database. Everybody wants to have their own isolated database so that they're not affected by something that someone else is doing. And that's also driving the adoption of database as a service on Kubernetes in a lot of enterprises. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, database as a service adoption, I can definitely mention uh, a couple of uh, companies that have decided um, to use our operator Cloud Native PG to serve customers. Uh, one is IBM Cloud Pack, um, and Cloud Native PG is used by pretty much uh, more than 20, I think, uh, uh, use cases within IBM Cloud Pack. Then there's also a startup in the Postgres world called, called Tembo. Tembo, they have chosen our operator, and they are um, offering Postgres database as a service on top of Kubernetes. Uh, there's also my company with uh, uh, the former Big Animal and now ADB Postgres AI cloud service. Um, the other approach that I actually see a lot uh, now is to um, uh, use uh, Cloud Native PG, for example, to provide database as a service internally to the company. And in terms of the adoption like these, I, I, I want to mention, for example, Google Cloud and uh, AKS that are adopters of Cloud Native PG, uh, and that enable uh, those organizations that run uh, in these Kubernetes services to uh, install a, a Postgres both as a DBAS or even in a microservice um, database uh, scenario where the application actually lives in the same namespace as the database, which is, uh, I think, a trend that we'll see probably more in the next few years. Okay, so that developers own the database, whereas in a DBAS um, scenario, it's like you know that DevOps kind of world where uh, DBuzz is an interface so that infrastructure people can provide a database to application developers. But I think the future will be more towards the microservice database, but that's a different topic. Are there any other benefits besides standardization that these people have mentioned, DeepD? Hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with ease of um, deployment, right? So once something is exposed as a service, you have either APIs or a UI or something like that where people can self-serve. And if people can self-serve, then that just takes out the entire loop of going back and forth with, I don't know, you have to file a JIRA ticket. No, I don't want to file a JIRA ticket. I want to just click a few buttons. So I think that um, is also something that drives people towards this, just more automation. Things GitHub's are easy well. to start up and use. Absolutely. Did you have something else, Gabrielle? And GitOps as well. I mean, yeah. that's, that's very common. Yeah. Anything else to add? Yeah, I, I think three top reasons uh, are strategy, so standardization across technologies. The second one is cost. That's what we see a lot is that it's not only about databases and Kubernetes, to be fair, it's also about in general, cloud-native technologies. And the third one is, yes, uh, automation or um, self-service capabilities. Again, Kubernetes as a, and CNCF ecosystem provides a variety of tools that can do blue-green deployment, scaling, and everything is automated for you. You just need to know how to use those. These are the top three. 
Yeah, and the, in general, for example, uh, we have a thing to distinguish between two use cases. Those that move away from the cloud, like you know, like RDS or SEMA database as a service, or IS, so VMs. So I think in that case, it's about uh, mitigating the risk of vendor lock-in. So also increasing uh, predictability of costs. So you, you can move to Kubernetes inside, uh, for example, bare metal, okay, as I was mention, mentioning before, or a hybrid situation with VMs and, and bare metal for Postgres. I always say cattle, pets, and elephants. Okay, so elephant is Postgres a mascot, but it needs to be treated a, a little bit differently. Okay? The other one is, and that's especially true in Europe, where uh, there's open source mandates and now a new data act, and uh, you know, data sovereignty and data portability become crucial now. So with Kubernetes, you can achieve cloud neutrality for everything and also for Postgres. So um, uh, what you can do is free yourself from all forms of vendor lock-in and enable you to move your data anywhere. So have private, you know, whether private, pu public, a hybrid, or multi-cloud using the same stack, which is something unprecedented. Never seen that before. So I think that's, that's, that's uh, you know, one of the benefits for, for all of these. I would say the other thing that's um, contributing to it a little bit is also like, the disaster recovery and um, all of the things people want to have around that. Because with Kubernetes, you can have something on standby in a different region and in a much shorter time than would have been possible in the past, you will be able to bring up your standby environment for your database if your primary region goes down. And Correct. while that is expected to be extremely rare, it can happen and it's something that enterprises have to plan for. Absolutely. Um, and let's move to specifically DBaaS now. So when we talk about DBaaS, what does this look like for the user? What are the best practices? Sergey, you wanna kick us off? For DBAS uh, using the operators, right? that's the question. Yeah, so the the best, it's not the best practices. Is I believe what we see a lot in the market today is uh, there is this idea. Uh, uh, Gabriel mentioned uh, cloud neutrality, but there is also this idea cloud readiness, uh, where company makes a decision. Okay, we are running on prem today, but at some point we might think that we want to move to Kubernetes and or maintain a hybrid environment. And that's why they choose uh, Kubernetes. And then they start thinking, okay, what do we do? How do we implement our own database as a service so that our developers can use it or our customers? And uh, yeah, definitely operators are one of the first choices because uh, uh, you, you can easily solve the deployment problem with Helm charts and with uh, YAML manifest within Fraser code but uh, solving day two operations and the internal pieces of databases is not that easy, hence choosing your operators. And then the next step is adding some UI or API on top of it so that your developers or your customers or your applications can utilize that. And the best practices differ. Um, I see some companies, recently I was talking to some company, I don't remember their name, they're using uh, backstage, and they are just triggering Argo CD from backstage to deploy databases on Kubernetes, and that's yeah. their DBAS solution, which works for them perfectly. Yeah, that's very Yeah, common. yeah, they, they, they like it a lot. Um, another example is, uh, again, I mentioned Nokia, what they did, they have their own, I don't remember how it's called, solution that they created to deploy applications, deploy databases, and uh, they were using, I think, public clouds before, and then they decided, okay, we're gonna use Percona operators in Kubernetes instead, and they just switched uh, some code base and started using it. So yeah, that's what I think we see mostly. Self-serve is something uh, that's definitely standing out as a best practice among uh, the ones I have seen. Uh, Self-serve automation enabling uh, end use your end users who typically are application developers to do uh, as many things as possible on their own, including scaling up 
So maybe uh, to start with, you choose a smaller size database, but you decide that you need a bigger one and you should be able to do that. Um, Yeah, um, as far as, for example, Postgres is concerned, I would say architecture is definitely the number one recommendation, okay? So going back to cattle, pets, and elephants, we need to think about Postgres uh, when we put it in Kubernetes to take advantage of the 25 uh, plus more years of evolution of Postgres, okay? Um, in terms of especially uh, replication. So for example, the best recommendation we have is to um, use uh, Postgres nodes, dedicate pos uh, nodes for Postgres, even using local storage, and then uh, use uh, taints, uh, labels, and uh, with affinity rules and uh, tolerations, not selectors and so on, logically place the clusters you create on separate physical nodes, okay, in different availability zones or not. If you're in the cloud, you usually have multiple availability zones, so you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, spread the full tolerance ac across three data centers. On-prem, usually have two, and in this case, you probably have two different uh, clusters, Kubernetes clusters, so the operator cannot talk to them, so you need to have a different architecture. Normally, we suggest uh, three, three instances, so one primary and two standby with synchronous replication to avoid data loss. But this is an entire pattern if you compare, for example, Postgres with any other stateful workload. That's why I think it's important to understand what application you are deploying. And the second advice is to rely on Kubernetes and all the innovation that is brought by Kubernetes and the ecosystem for the rest. Sergey was mentioning uh, interfaces, UIs, they are, re they are really important. But then when, it, when you put a database in an infrastructure, you have to think about observability, security, uh, certificates, and you should rely on what's out there. So you have, if you have s uh, standard interfaces, you can talk to anyone in the Kubernetes uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. So building a little bit on what Gabriel said, it's important to separate out test and especially load testing workloads from production workloads because you do not want your test workload or load testing to affect what you are serving to your actual production users. Um, yeah. It's okay? And no, I'm I can done. take also, sorry, you made me think about another thing that I, I'm seeing, you know, because you talk to people so you get to know use cases and what they're doing. Uh, we see an increase of cost of um, virtual machines, okay? So one opportunity that Kubernetes brings with Postgres, in the case of Postgres, is that you can move a VM-based Postgres into a, a bare metal Kubernetes node and save those costs, okay? And separate, uh, if you separate the storage of Postgres from the rest, you get predictability of performance. Okay, so this is important to add on what Deepti was saying. Thank you. Which reminds me of my next point, which is security. We didn't talk much about security. Security requirements are different uh, depending on whether you're running an internal platform or you're running a platform that can have users from many enterprises. But at this point, certain things like encryption at rest, encryption in transit, all of these things have become standardized, stable stakes that everybody has to provide. So especially if you're building a commercial database as a service, all these are just things that you have to do. You can't even call them best practices. They're like exactly. the only practices. We take them for granted. And the good thing is that Kubernetes does all of that, you know. So we talked about um, some of the best practices. What about, are there any other common pitfalls or challenges that you want people to avoid that you've heard of? Um, Sergey, you wanna start? Uh, yeah, I, I think the biggest issue that I see is the, the assumption that I can run my database that I run today on VMs on Kubernetes the same way as I'm doing today. So it's like the assumption that it's just a lift and shift exercise. Exactly. 
And it's the biggest problem that I see when I talk to users, to customers. Um, like, I have this fancy script in my VM environment. I want to use the same script because it does A, B, C. Uh, why your operator can't do that? Well, because it seems like you misunderstand the purpose or you misunderstand the idea. That's why. And uh, that, that, that is what is killing the desire at some point to move databases to Kubernetes because user has this perception that, OK, it doesn't work for me. It just sucks. It, it's a bad technology, right? But it, it, it's not the reality. And uh, the, the solution here is definitely you need to change your mindset. It's microservices. It's cloud native ecosystem. And you need to understand and play by the rules how it all works. And then it's going to produce you with better performance, with better reliability, with better everything. That's the biggest feed file that, that I can share. Uh, there are probably two things. One is not planning enough for migrating existing workloads. Because uh, anyone who's migrating from running a database on VMs or bare metal to running it in Kubernetes, eventually you want everyone to be running on whatever your standard platform is. You don't want to leave anyone behind. And it's very important to make it easy for those teams to migrate their databases. And part of that is providing almost zero downtime migration, because no one wants their application to be down because somebody else has decided that there is a mandate and everyone needs to move into this new platform. So that's one thing. The other thing is that it's actually very easy to over-provision and waste resources when you're doing something new. And it takes a bit of experimentation to get things right-sized. And with Kubernetes, there is going to be a certain amount of overhead that you have to allow for with the API server and just the machinery of Kubernetes. So it's easy to undersize it or oversize it, and it takes a bit of um, work to get it to the right size so that you're not wasting resources. Because computing resources are now one of the biggest cost items for especially technology companies. Your human cost, payroll, is number one. But the second item is your computing cost, whether it's cloud or on-prem. And you want to be able to um, get that right. So for me, challenge. I mean, although there are technical challenges, things things to improve, they are more on the sociological and the human sphere. And I'm, for example, when we started this project, initially we were targeting uh, Kubernetes people, and the f this phase lasted five years. And I'm really happy about the outcomes. I think our operator is, makes makes a lot of sense for uh, Kubernetes people now. Now my second phase is started to uh, address the DBAs. Okay, so um, when I talk to DBAs, the challenge first is to uh, the, normally a DBA ignores what's out there, and I've seen every time I talk to to DBAs that they learn Kubernetes, they love it, but very often they don't even open that window, the door to see what's Kubernetes. But so I think we see, we will see a lot of potential in that in that phase, and I think the challenge will be to form it, what I call a T-shaped profile. Uh, so if you're a DBA, you need to learn enough Kubernetes to then have smart conversations with people that manage infrastructure. Okay, so I think the challenge right now is to uh, get DBAs more familiar with Kubernetes, like they did in the past with Linux. Okay, to me, and and that that will happen. Yeah, we had in our DOK report, there was a pullout on AI, and we heard the same thing about data teams needing to kind of learn Kubernetes as well. So we're seeing this across any, any kind of data workload. Yeah. And that's part of DevOps, if you think about that, OK? So I think it's a mind shift, but it will happen. And we're here, too. With DOK and the Postgres community, for example, we want to work more closely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now is the time when we look into our crystal balls and think about the future of DBaaS. So what do you all see as a future? What do you see evolving? What's going to change that's going to help support this? Start with. Sorry. No, let's start from start the left. Okay, I'll start. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, <laughs> I think the future will be, uh, we're now in a phase, in my opinion, that we are bridging these two worlds when I talk about Kubernetes and Postgres in a way that, that had never done before, never been done before. So for just to give you an example, uh, I have a very small patch introduced in Postgres 17 
because I, we brought a different point of view when using Postgres. Okay? It, it disables other system. So you cannot change imperatively the configuration of Postgres because in Kubernetes, we don't want that to happen. Okay? This is just an example. So we are working now with uh, EDB to improve the, how Postgres manages extensions to then uh, bring the improvements in Kubernetes to load container images at runtime that contain the extensions so that you can easily introduce extensions like PG Vector or others when you run a database. So I think the future will be more about getting these two worlds, uh, so the database world in my case, and Kubernetes closer. It won't be just the internal DBAS um, systems that we'll see uh, being adopted more and more, but also the commercial databases as a service, of which there are many, and uh, probably many people in this room use them. Uh, the smaller ones, the, the newer startups are all launching their database, managed database platforms on Kubernetes. The biggest players in this market, for example, Google Cloud SQL. I don't know exactly what it runs on, but given that uh, Kubernetes came out of Google and everything in Google has always run on Borg, there's a very good chance that it actually runs on Kubernetes. And we will see more and more of these managed databases which will run on Kubernetes because it becomes so much easier to manage thousands of databases with Kubernetes than without. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> meditating. So, uh, yeah, I, I have a next talk which uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution of uh, databases on Kubernetes and I will mention uh, what we're doing in this space. But um, in, I, in the world of Kubernetes, uh, I think Kelsey Hightower told that, that if in like next 10 days we're still gonna be talking about Kubernetes, it means that we failed, because <laughs> that we failed to uh, create something new, something better, right? And it's an interesting idea, but I, I like to think that uh, Kubernetes adoption is uh, growing and more and more companies adopting it. and. Uh, Maturing ecosystem is going to remove the barriers for a lot of people to uh, run database in Kubernetes, and it will be more comfortable for everyone to do that. And we will see the appearance of tools that would enable a much better user experience to do that, not just through YAML manifest, Helm charts, and so on. Uh, and as uh, Deepthi mentioned, that we're going to have it not only in private space, but in uh, public clouds. and. Uh, other vendors yeah. adopting it. But uh, just, uh, just a sec, who is this room? Because you guys came here, uh, is using database in Kubernetes. Anyone is running it or? No, you can put it now. <laughs> okay, that's great, okay. So I assume uh, everyone else is going to. That's great. Yeah. And sorry, so you made me think about one thing, you know, kind, for example. How many of you use kind Kubernetes in Docker? I, it, I mean, we have a playground with CMPG where we simulate two regions, two cloud regions in your laptop. And you can create disposable, reusable, repeatable environments that have the database inside on your laptop and simulate what happens out there. I mean, this is magic. Because this is power that every one of you has, opportunities to create databases. You could be the next startup for the DBAS, for example, just using Kubernetes and Postgres. So I think it's, it's a fantastic phase, you know, like the CEO of Suze was saying before, you know, so we need to enjoy it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we have a, a, a little bit of time for questions. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? There's mics, uh, I think there's a mic right over there. In there. And, yeah, there is one. oh, right next to you. <laughs> no, it's right next to you, don't, don't, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> advantage of using database as a service on Kubernetes as opposed to something like RDS that AWS offers? So the question was, what's the benefit of using a DBAS on Kubernetes versus a database like, I didn't hear the last part. RDS. RDS. Okay. Okay, I can take that. Um, so there are companies that adopt RDS as their database 
of choice, and everyone ends up deploying their development and production databases on that. But there are definitely companies that don't want to do that, that still want to run things on their own. And those are the ones who are able to actually do everything on Kubernetes at probably a lower cost than what RDS would be. So cost is a huge factor, and wanting to be self-hosted is another factor. Yeah, and data portability, for example. Try and move data. I have multi-cloud, for example, with zero downtime migrations of your da you know, data from RDS to another place. So it's vendor lock-in, essentially, OK? So you have the opportunity to free yourself from, from that situation, OK? Then, of course, every organization is free. You know, they, they, they have the, the cost-benefits analysis, you know, but it's, to go back to, to deep, there's also costs. And then are you sure you're running Postgres open source, for example? Yeah, I would also add that if you're a startup and you have like one database, don't do that. Don't run databases in Kubernetes because uh, yeah. it just does not make much sense for me at least because you want to iterate, you want to move fast and learning curve, there's still it's still there. You would need to learn the new technology, you would need to understand Kubernetes, how it works and so on. But if you are running at some scale, then cost is going to become a problem for you. Then multi-cloud, no vendor lock-in is going to be a problem. And Kubernetes can solve it for you. I have a question on DR for databases. So with more databases coming onto Kubernetes, do you think these databases will solve DR problems by themselves? Or would they rely on some support from storage infrastructures to provide solutions like sync replication, snapshotting, backup recovery? I didn't get the question. The question is about disaster recovery, whether databases can uh, handle all of that themselves, or they are relying on replication, backup, restore, snapshotting type of things. Uh, I think it's, it's not exactly right to think of those things as being external to the database. So most uh, databases actually provide you the ability to do replication, snapshotting, backup, recovery. And those features are provided precisely so that you can recover from uh, disaster situations. So definitely, you will still be relying on them. And even in a Kubernetes environment, you'll be using them. It's just that you'll be using the operator to trigger those things automatically instead of a human having to trigger them. Yeah. I want to add uh, one point. There's two levels of, of disaster recovery here. One is the application level, because you have to imagine Postgres is an application in Kubernetes terms. If you're a DBA and you know Postgres, Postgres has a very mature continuous backup uh, system with point-in-time recovery, you want to enable DBAs to use those functionalities. But then you have to think about uh, how an operator, for example, integrates with the Kubernetes level uh, backup solution that also backups, backs up uh, config maps, cluster resources, and all of that, okay? So my advice is to uh, look at these two. And for Postgres, my advice is not to use storage uh, replication because Postgres has a very advanced solution, but for other workloads, it might, might be different, okay? Yeah, what Gabriel said, and I think we're running out of time. Yeah. We already ran out of time, so. If anybody has any questions, we'll be in the back somewhere. Uh, the last Thank question. you for coming. Uh,